very real questions are starting to be asked about how we're dealing with COVID now. There is increasing medical and scientific evidence to suggest that long COVID could be far more dangerous than we'd previously realised. It can, apparently, affect nearly every organ in the body. What's more, it doesn't appear to discriminate. You have as much chance of getting it, whether you're five or 105. Indeed, some medical practitioners now believe the burden of long COVID could soon be measured on a par with the burden of cancer and heart disease for our health services. Well, a little while ago, I spoke to Dr Ray Duncan, a cardiologist at Newcastle NHS, one of the country's most prominent researchers into long COVID. Dr Ray Duncan, like a lot of people, I, I know many folk who through the last month or two have been ill. They've had maybe flu, maybe COVID. They've not been testing. They've shaken it off after a week or if they're unlucky, two or three, and they've got back on with it. And they just think, well, so what? It's all the same now. Why is that attitude wrong? Hi, Martin. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, it, it's, it's interesting that, that there appears to be a slight disconnect between what the kind of boots in the ground public perception of COVID is now and what the scientists are finding in the research studies. So obviously, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were very concerned about the acute deaths. We've had over you know, 7 million people die globally. We have over 65 million disabled by long COVID. Um, but as, you know, in the event of vaccination and, um, and as we have had new and more and more Omicron variants, what we tend to be seeing now is that the acute index infection, the acute infection for many appears to be milder and it appears to feel for many like a bad cold or a bad flu. Um, but, but one of the things that the science is showing is that SARS isn't a cold, it's not a cold virus. Um, and if we think of SARS-CoV-2 simply in terms of the acute index infection, what we are doing is we're only really looking at the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the bulk of the iceberg, as we know, lies under the surface. And if we don't know to look for it, then we don't see it and we can't avoid it. And for SARS-2, the bulk of the iceberg and the surface that we are concerned about, those of us that are, are treating patients and, and researching this condition, is the fact that it, it, certain acute infectious diseases, include SARS, including SARS-CoV-2, can cause chronic long-term health issues. Oh, to what extent? I, I was reading some of your work, and, and, and one of the, the stats that really struck me was in Canada, they're finding if, if you've had mm -hmm. three, or, three or more bouts of COVID, as it were, you've got a 38% chance of getting long COVID. Can that be right? So obviously with any health surveys, there will be a degree of, um, you know, selection bias and, and, and uh, um, so th the stats might be slightly less than that, but even say it was 30% rather than 38%, that's still a huge part of the population with repeat infections. But we also have published data that came out of the States a little while ago now with Saeed Al Ali's group showing that the more times you get repeatedly infected with SARS-CoV-2, the increased risk, cumulative risk you have of developing long COVID, but not just long COVID, there's also an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, endocrine disease, and we're also seeing an increased risk of autoimmune diseases too. Do, so do they go hand in hand? Because there's a danger with, I, I was reading your, your, your analysis as long COVID could bring with it organ damage, really serious unpleasant things, but a long way down the track. Is that right? Well, you have to, you know, we have to be aware that this is still emerging research. There's still a lot we don't know about this virus. There's still a lot we don't know about the long-term effects. But what we do know is that on a population basis, and these are epidemiological studies, and we have many of them now, um, several very large studies across multiple continents looking at millions of patients, all showing generally the same thing, that after SARS-CoV-2 infection, there is an increase incidence of cardiovascular disease, including heart attack and stroke, and that there may be an increased incidence of cardiovascular um, disease death, fivefold increased incidence of death for up to 18 months after index infection. Now, these studies were uh, predominantly in, a, in an unvaccinated population, and we do have some data suggesting that 
vaccination at a population level does reduce somewhat your risk of developing long COVID and cardiovascular disease, but it doesn't get rid of it completely. Um, but what we also need to remember, Martin, is that COVID is a spectrum and long COVID is just one end of that spectrum. And there's some very early emerging research now, some of which is still being peer reviewed and not, not yet fully published, starting to look at individuals that have been infected, felt like it was a bad cold, felt like they've fully recovered. Um, and in some of the individuals studied, there, there has been some evidence of, of some suggestion of silent underlying organ damage. Um, there was a recent paper uh, that was being presented at the Radiological Society just a couple of months ago um, in North America, and they were using advanced MRI techniques to scan the brains of individuals who had developed long COVID, but also individuals who'd had COVID and felt fully recovered, and comparing them to individuals who'd never had COVID, and showing that there was widespread microstructural changes in the brains of those that had been infected. And is there, is there a particular demographic who are being affected by this? Can this affect you? Can you, can you could you just as easily get organ damage, you know, brain issues, heart issues from long COVID if you're, if you're young and healthy as, as if you're old? So what we know so far, and, and, and we, we're still learning a lot about this virus, is that there are some groups that appear to be more at risk than others. For example, those with underlying health conditions. We've seen disproportionate long COVID rates in certain occupations, such as healthcare workers and teaching staff. But the, the flip side isn't true. So although there may be groups that are, are, are at increased risk, that does not mean if you are young and fit and healthy that you have no risk and you're not going to get long COVID. Right. And I, you know, I, I run a clinic. I see a lot of long COVID patients. I have patients, you know, 16, 18, 20, 26, 22, 25, who've, who were completely fit and healthy. Some of them are amateur athletes who have been severely affected by long COVID. Some of my patients... Um, struggle to walk some cannot stand for more than two minutes having previously been you know athletic individuals some are in wheelchairs mm. I have patients who are completely bedridden who can only sit up for 20 to 30 minutes at a time because the virus has damaged their autonomic nervous systems and they can no longer control their heart rates now, sure. now there are some we don't have a cure for long COVID but there are some certain phenotypes or subgroups that we can treat and we are treating and we are seeing some of these patients are making improvements and getting better but this winter has just been devastating for some of my patients because yeah. so many are getting reinfected and all the good work and the hard work we've put into trying to get them better get them back to work get them back to school it's just all been completely undone again. Yeah, I mean, we don't hear so much about long COVID treatment anymore. I mean, good on you and your colleagues. You're still doing enormous amounts of work on this. But the more you find, the more worrying it seems to become. Are we taking this seriously enough as a country at government level? I mean, how are other countries looking at it? I think there are issues in a lot of countries. I think we really need to start following the science. And I think all countries really need to start listening to some of the World Health Organization advice on this. Dr. Ted Ross, the Director General of the WHO, very clearly and very publicly stated in April last year that approximately one in 10 infections, not one in 10 people, one in 10 infections will result in the post-COVID condition suggesting that if we do not get a handle on the high transmission rates from this virus, and it's still here, COVID's not gone anywhere, unfortunately, that hundreds of millions were going to require longer term care. Wow. And some of this, I think, is avoidable. And we already have the data to suggest that, you know, public health protections like putting in clean air and HEPA filters into schools and nurseries have already been shown in several studies now in Italy, in Belgium, in Finland, and in the UK, to reduce COVID outbreaks in schools, to reduce sickness absence, to improve school attendance rates. But, but clean air in schools and hospitals have got other benefits as well mm. because they protect, protect us from other indoor you know, pathogens. And what, what, about uh, what, we, what about what we can do, um, Dr Duncan? Uh, we're talking about vaccination. I mean, you're mm -hmm. saying there that the, the fact that one in 10 infections can result in long COVID, that there's your, your stat. You know, if you get it three times, you, 
it would suggest that there, there's the arithmetic. You've got a one in three chance of getting long COVID. That will focus a lot of people's minds. Other than putting clean air filters and so on in schools, are you suggesting we should go back to some kind of uh, restrictions, mask wearing, you know, if you've testing, if you've got it, keep yourself out of circulation for a couple of weeks? Are we too laissez-faire about COVID at the moment? Uh, I, I think... I think we are too laissez-faire about COVID, if I'm being honest. And I think that from my perspective, I'm very concerned about the longer term health implications. Um, you know, we already have economic modelling data for the UK um, from Joseph Kwan, one of our UK health economists, suggesting that long COVID alone may be costing the UK economy 3.3 billion per annum. That's just for long COVID. That's not including, you know, increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, increased incidence of neurological disease. Um, you know, we're seeing immune dysfunction, autoimmune diseases, and, and there's a lot we don't yet know. Um, yeah. Some of the some of the, the work that's coming out of the National Phenome Centre in Australia, again, it's not fully published yet. It's been currently being peer reviewed, but it has been presented publicly. So I am allowed to to mention it. And this is work that's come out from Professor Jeremy Nicholson and Professor Julian Rust and their team, they have taken um, blood samples from thousands of individuals who've been infected with COVID from around the world. And they are looking at metabolic pathways and have shown that COVID may be altering some of our metabolic pathways. And one of the pathways they've seen in particular is cardiometabolic pathways. And these are pathways and, and blood markers of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease risk. Right. And what we are seeing is that after SARS-CoV-2 infection, these cardiovascular disease risk markers are going up. And in some individuals, they are not coming back down even a year after infection. And, and they're seeing this in children as well as in adults, which is obviously yeah. quite concerning. That is a really, so think, a really stark I think, warning. I think there's a lot that we could do. I, I, I wouldn't call them public health restrictions. I think we're beyond that. We're not talking lockdowns here. Yeah. You know, we, we, this virus is ubiquitous now. We have to learn to live with it, but we have to learn to live with it safely. So mm. things that we could be doing, for example, would be you know putting as a good start, we'd be putting clean air into to schools and, and sure. hospitals. Yeah. That okay. Would be a very good start. Well, listen, I mean, what, what, what is clear is that we, we are only at the beginnings of the journey of understanding this thing. And the more we find out, the, the more worrying it becomes, which is uh, an unpleasant thought. But it's, it's where we must leave it. And thank you for all the work you are doing on this, you and your colleagues. Uh, Dr. Ray Duncan, thanks for your time this Sunday morning. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's really sobering stuff. It was emphasised, actually, as we were watching that back. One of the crew here, one of the members of the crew behind the camera, was telling me that he's had long COVID for two years. He was almost getting back to normal, got COVID again in January, and now he has been pushed right back to square one, right back at the very worst of it. So although we don't necessarily hear about long COVID all the time, it is there, and it's an issue that I think we may well hear a lot more about in the near future.